Welcome. Welcome to you, however you're joining us this morning. Whatever the state of your mind, your heart, your body, your soul, you are welcome. Greetings to all of you here in the church. Welcome to Mary and Michael back here for the first time in 18 months, perhaps. And to all of you joining us on Zoom, on Facebook, YouTube, however you're with us today, you are all welcome. I begin with some words by the Unitarian Universalist minister, Jack Mendelssohn. Here in this sanctuary of dreams and wisdom and beauty, we come to grow, to be healed, to stretch mind and heart, to be challenged, to be renewed, to be helped in our own continuing struggles for meaning and for love, to help build a world with more justice and mercy in it, to be counted among the hopers and the doers. In the face of cynicism, darkness, brutality around us and within, we seek to align ourselves with a living community that would affirm rather than despair, that would think and act rather than simply adjust and succumb. Here, we invite the spirit of our own humanity and the healing powers under, around, through and beyond it to give us the nerve and grace, the toughness and sensitivity to search out the truth that frees and the life that maketh all things new. Words by Jack Mendelssohn. So let us now begin, as is our custom, by lighting our chalice flame as a symbol of our free religious faith. And if you're at home and you would like to light a candle with me, then please do so. We light this flame to rekindle the divine spark within each one of us. May it shine brightly, bringing light into the dark places of our minds and into the broken places of our world. May it be so. So this week I'm continuing in the theme of the web of existence. Last week we were meeting the beloved. This week we're meeting each other. And we're going to start by singing a hymn. Um, we are daughters of the stars. This is hymn number 183, 183 in the purple hymn books. You'll also see the words on the screen, but what you won't do is hear anybody singing to accompany you this time. We don't have a recording of this song, so I'm relying on you to provide the beautiful noise, the beautiful sounds as we sing, We Are Daughters of the Stars.
kept up with it. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Let us enter a time of prayer together. And in the light of our theme of meeting each other and also following yesterday's 20th anniversary of 9-11, let us share the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. And I invite you to pause for a moment to bring into your own heart, your own mind's eye, anyone you know who is suffering at this time. And in this moment, you may like to hold them in the light or send them light and love from your heart to theirs. Blessed be us all. And so we come to our story. And Mary is going to read it for us. This is a story from the same collection as the story we heard last week from the Song of the Bird, Anthony de Mello. It's so lovely to see you all again and be here in person and not just watching in a, within a square. Don't Change is the title of the story by Anthony DeMello. Quite strange, really, because it actually is rather like I was many, many years ago. You'll, you'll hear that in a moment then. I was a neurotic for years. I was anxious and depressed and selfish. Everyone kept telling me to change. I resented them and I agreed with them. And I wanted to change, but I simply couldn't, no matter how hard I tried. What hurt the most was that, like the others, my best friend kept insisting that I change. 
I felt powerless and trapped. Then one day, my friend said to me, don't change. Stay exactly as you are. I love you just as you are. Those words were music to my ears. Don't change. Don't change. Don't change. I love you as you are. I relaxed. I came alive. And suddenly, I changed. And I now know that I couldn't really change until I'd found someone who loved me, whether I changed or not. Thank you, Mary, for reading that story so beautifully. I'm going to suggest we just pause for a moment and reflect on the story. And maybe just think about any ways in which it resonates for us in our lives. Perhaps times when we felt in difficult feelings, difficult experiences that we felt trapped in times when we've wanted to change, couldn't change, times when maybe we felt accepted by someone or by ourselves. And suddenly that's given us the freedom that we needed. Just take a few moments to just reflect on the story.
I'm um, very grateful to Uni Lovelet for giving me permission to play her music this morning. She's a beautiful Norwegian singer. So I'm wondering, how is your sense of time these days? <laughs> During the past 18 months, I feel as though I've lost all sense of mine. And I'm still confused, to be honest. I still have this feeling of being a bit lost in time. And how long is a week, actually? And how about your sense of self? I don't know how strong that was before the pandemic swept through our lives. Or whether that feeling of being yourself or knowing who you are was affected by the pandemic in any way. Perhaps it was shaken. Perhaps it was strengthened. Or neither. Are you the same person as you were before? Am I, I wonder. These always help. Recently, I had some friends to stay. The first to arrive was Alistair, who stayed for three nights, and then I took him to the station to head off on the next leg of his trip. And I collected Stephen, who um, some of you will know took our service here a couple of weeks ago. Um, and since they overlapped, the three of us shared a cup of tea in the Pumpkin Cafe on the station forecourt. If you live in Plymouth, you probably know it. I mean, it's a soulless place, if ever there was one. And not really conducive to meeting anybody. But there's not much choice. And I had a moment of existential crisis. Because in that moment, I wasn't honestly sure who I was. I know who I am with each of these friends individually but there was a jarring sense of worlds colliding as we all sat down together and of my own identity somehow collapsing. And that's not because I put on an act with friends, no more than anyone else, else does anyway, I don't think. I am myself in all situations. After, after all, who else could I be? As Peter Bradley Adams sang, in our opening music. It's just that whoever I'm with, there's a particular dynamic that's unique to being with that person. So the arrival of a third person inevitably shifts the dynamic. All three of us had to adjust, especially in that strange hinterland between arriving and leaving at a station or an airport. It felt weird, a process of disassembling and reassembling. And it made me realize again that being myself is not a fixed thing. There isn't just one version of me. I imagine there isn't just one version of you. Of course, I'm basically the same person, 
I look the same, I sound the same. There's still the same familiar old internal monologues going on and the same characteristics and foibles. They follow me everywhere. But when I'm with one person, whoever that may be, there's something unique about the quality of that particular interaction. Do you find that? Different people bring out different facets of ourselves. A more playful side, perhaps, or a more serious one. And the interests and the memories, the histories and so on that we share with one person are quite different from the connections that we've made with someone else. This is obvious, I'm sure. And once I've got over feeling discombobulated in that uh, pumpkin cafe, I began to appreciate how spending quality time with another person is sacred. Not least because it is unique. And how if we are open and alert to the possibility, then something brand new can be created or maybe it's given to us every time we meet. Like new paints being mixed on a palette, the results can be something fresh and original and unforeseen. Something not previously understood or touched on can come to light. Even with someone we've known for years and years. Of course, communication between us can take place fairly superficially, but also it's going on at a level beneath and beyond, beyond what we're conscious of. When we are two souls meeting each other, each with their own potential to give and to receive, in those times when we're breathing the same air and sharing the same moment in time and watching, seeing, listening to what unfolds, that time is precious. It is meeting. It is to be honoured and treasured. It probably goes without saying that any encounter with another human being will always be more meaningful if we are sharing from our hearts and also listening with our hearts. Especially if we share a mutual understanding that meeting each other not only matters, but it's what matters most right now as we make that connection. This kind of communication is more than simply passing the time of day. Though no, passing the time of day in order to wheel oil, rather, the wheels of social interaction has, can also be great. But for a spiritual community, I think we aspire to something more, to something deeper. We might reasonably hope to enter shared time and space together with the intention of truly meeting each other. Meeting each other where we are right now. And in that moment, I believe we are held by the Divine Spirit. This is when our connection can be felt most deeply. This is when we know, not only in theory, that we're interdependent and interconnected but also we know it directly we feel it immediately and such meeting can be surprisingly hard to find in everyday life there's a lot of noise out there and, and we all contribute to it uh, there's a lot of chat there's an awful lot of opinion 
a lot of argument, a lot of grandstanding, taking positions, and not always a lot of time and space to truly meet another person in the presence of the holy. We need to actually make that time. As a congregation, it sometimes feels to me anyway that we, we do this best when we intentionally hold space for that purpose, as we do, I think, when we've been holding our Zoom congregational meetings. And it may sound strange to, um, to say that we can create holy space on Zoom, but I feel that we do. And there is a sharing from the heart and a listening. And in our heart and soul gatherings. And probably any time that we sit with another person particularly one-to-one. -one. And we find that then the, the pace of talking slows. The temperature drops out of it, the heat. And our insistence on being right or on being heard ourselves or getting our opinion across, all that can give way to a more generous sharing and a genuine interest in each other. I know that some of you are familiar with the kinds of guidelines that we tend to use in small groups, um, which help to create this safe space where it's possible and or more possible to meet um, each other and make them kind of safe spaces where people feel free to share. So for example, we'll talk about being present as far as possible, as far as we're able, bringing our attention and talking about speaking from the perspective of I. This is how it is for me. It might not be how it is for you. This is how it is for me. Having that mutual understanding that what is shared is treated with respect and care it's held safely. And bringing an attitude of openness and possibility, willingness to hear another person and also to be heard ourselves, willing to make ourselves more vulnerable. And it's strange because when we do this, we may feel our sense of time and our sense of self Differently, I think the sense of time and self can feel heightened in those moments and yet paradoxically they can also feel as though they've just fallen away and there is no time and there is no self. And it matters, doesn't it, that we make space for our deeper selves to emerge because that is where our essential goodness is, that is our divinity, it is our own holiness that can then emerge. It's the divinity which we all share. And it's when we can connect again with what last week I was calling the beloved, and you might call God, or the oneness, or the divine spirit. We can truly meet each other in this divine space. I mean, we can practice this anywhere. We can do it over coffee and we can do it in our breakout rooms. We can just make spaces for that kind of meeting and that kind of interaction. And if it sounds a bit daunting to you, it, it, it isn't really. I mean, how, after all, how do you usually start a conversation? I mean, I usually start by saying, how are you? Which is pretty simple. The difference perhaps is only being in open to hearing how someone really is. And maybe if you get an, oh, I'm okay, or I'm fine. Maybe being willing to ask again, how are you? How are you really? Listening and sharing are two sides of the same coin. We need both. But if we're willing to create mutually respectful spaces, we may get 
more than we bargained for, we may not only meet each other, which is a wonder in itself, but we may also meet ourselves in that space and also meet our God. May it be so. We're going to sing again, and this time you do have the help of the recording of the Unitarian Music Society singing along with you. And I don't know how often we've sung this. I'm not sure we've sung it much. Um, it's number 204 in the Purple Hymn Books. It's called When I'm Frightened. And I think it's rather a lovely hymn. Uh, so number 204. And um, do sing along as you're able. Again, the words will be on the screen too. So let's see how we get on. I hope you might recognise the tune or be able to pick it up as we go. singing singing that one um in, in the old days we used to have a collection at this point which we don't do anymore um we but we do have a, a basket here um for those of you who would like to leave a contribution we do we do of course rely on um generosity of of people to help us keep going so if you're able to leave something that'd be marvelous and if you're online uh, there are ways of uh, contributing online as well, um, which I think I send out reasonably regularly. So do do feel free. Uh, just a little reminder, you know, um, because the, the, the old routine is no longer. Just some closing words then now. Um, and then we'll have our closing music and video and um, breakout rooms as usual and time here for you for tea and coffee in the hall and do stay for the play by the way you've got time to go and get some lunch come back for 2 30 it's free it's only an hour i think it will be good 
Our closing words are by Martha L. Munson. We extinguish the chalice here that it might glow gently in our hearts. May it light your path as you leave this place. May it guide your way until we are together again. Amen.